Well, we're here on a Wednesday after the Elite Eight loss for the Creighton men's basketball team. Hello, everybody. Sam McEwen with Joel Lorenzi. This is the Half Court Press Podcast. Uh, I don't want to be too sad because, like, that was a hell of a hell of a weekend of basketball, in my opinion. Creighton falls short 57-56. Was that the final score? Mm-hmm. Oh, I, uh, I don't know if you're going to, like, remember that game forever. But I'll certainly remember the line, the final couple of seconds. Uh, hello, everybody. We're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about Creighton and and uh, a little bit of Nebraska at the end, transfer portal stuff. Joel uh, here with us to recap. Um, he wrote some great stuff from Louisville, great stuff from Denver. But the Louisville was commensurate with the further along they went in the tournament. I, I liked I liked the stuff he wrote. I appreciate so, it. I appreciate it. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the end of that game. Um, then then maybe not quite the end, but somewhat of the end of the game and why maybe it shifted, I felt like, in the last five minutes or so. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what's next because the reality is that once the season ends, things move really quickly in the college basketball world. I think <clears throat> Creighton may have a week. Um, they might get through the end of this week without anybody else making you know big decisions, but... Nebraska's already well down that track, and we're going to talk a little Nebraska transfer portal first. First, Joel, um, I'm going to write a little story about this later this week, but I wanted to congratulate you on the podcast of being the United States Basketball Writers Association rising star. Thank you. And you'll be going to you'll be going to Houston this weekend to receive that role, that yeah. award. Not not catching the <clears throat> not catching the first Final Four games, but catching it. Catching a netty, so yeah, some some cool stuff going. So down that's Saturday night, or is it Sunday? It's, it's, so the ceremony will happen Monday morning. Okay, so I'll Monday get morning. there Sunday and okay. um, kick it there Monday for the game and, and the ceremony. Then I'll I'll be back in the O. I'm, I assume you're hoping that Connecticut is there in the final game. Yeah, I I think everybody's assuming Connecticut's there. I mean, granted, I, I am not. Hey, Miami's had a great run, oh, but yeah. it's it's UConn versus the field right now. I mean, sure. they're plowing through everybody. Um, and I don't know. Hey, if there was a Big East team still left in the field. Who knows if they would plow through them because, you know, the, the Big East got some punches in, got some licks in during they the did. season. But um, in terms of non-conference, I mean, UConn has ran through the non-conference. That's right. Long. Did they lose to anybody in the non-conference? I'm not sure they did. No, I don't think they did. So, yeah, that's that's a very good point. Um, I, I, I am going to pick Connecticut to win the national championship. But I whoever wins that second game between Miami and Connecticut, I think, win it. Yeah. And I actually think Florida Atlantic is going to be their plan. That's just my hunch. I'm not, I'm not um, mad at that. I wouldn't be mad at it. I just, after having watched the game, and then I watched <laughs> it again um, Monday. The K-State game? No, the uh, San Diego State-Creighton game. I'm, oh, I'm, sure. st- I'm stunned San Diego State's in the Final Four. I just, I, I'm stunned they beat Alabama the way that they did. And I'm stunned they beat Creighton. Um, I, I mean, I think you could make an argument that of however many years that might be, you know, um, one of the weaker teams to make the Final Four, and in that I include the Loyola team from a couple of years ago. They're probably right there. Hey, 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 I don't know about this. But we'll get to this. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Because um, I want to talk about sort of the end of the game. So let's start with this. So, you know, we're all kind of watching on TV. There's probably you know, 2,000 Creighton fans in the arena. You're, you're in the media. The very final um, six seconds. So they... So McDermott calls timeout, uh, and then I think there's six seconds left, right? And then the ball is inbounded. What what's going through your mind and through your course and through you in that moment? Yeah, um, you talk on the, on the last inbound. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, well, not the Baylor Shireman one. No, the one <coughs> where the foul was called. Right, where where San Diego State had the ball. Right. Well, I pulled my phone out. I don't usually do this because I'm I'm always trying to live in the moment. But if I feel there's a chance for a game winner, then I'm okay. I'm, I don't want to capture that. I want to be able to look back on that. Um, I want the world to be able to see that from at least my point of view. And so, I have my phone out. I'm I'm looking at it. I got my phone down here by my chest, and I'm looking straight at the game, like up ahead. And um, I'm watching this unfold, and I see Tramel curl from from the right wing, I think. Um, and I'm like, man, like. The, the way they've defended these dudes all game long, um, the way he's coming off, I'm like, he might get downhill. And I was I was worried about a foul, but I wasn't worried about a foul 
happening so close to the clock. Like, I thought maybe they would have bumped him off, you know, a right. ball screen. He didn't even get a ball screen. I think it was a ghost or whatever. He didn't He didn't need a ball screen. He just got a, a foot, like, he got a step on, on a them. A rope hard. gave a ghost screen. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so um, I'm watching it unfold, and when I see the two – getting to each other's vicinity. I, I knew Tramiel. I, I knew his spots based on the last game. And um, I'm like, okay, he's either going to pull up and probably be short, or he's going to throw up a floater around that 10, 12-foot range. I think his, his is maybe deeper. And and there could be contact. But based on the way the game – and, I mean, this has been regurgitated all week long. Um, based on the way the game was called, I didn't think there was any sort of contact – uh, within reason, that was going to lead to this game not going to overtime should he miss. I'm thinking if there is contact, the way that, you know, San Diego State's been pressing, the way that, uh, you know, Creighton is, you know, helping in the gaps when they come off the drop coverage, I'm thinking there's no way in hell this game gets stopped. It's either a game winner or we're seeing free basketball. And so when the whistle's blown, it was so close to the buzzer that they just let the buzzer sound. Yep. It was. I mean, whoever was controlling the clock, they let the buzzer sound. And so I'm thinking, in that moment, I'm thinking, yo, like, this would be the all-time shittiest way for creating season to end. If it came down to <laughs> the free throw line, no chance to respond at all. Zero seconds on the clock. Because right. that's, that's what it felt like. It would end up being or at least point one right. or whatever. Um and then obviously they added like 1.2, which didn't matter in the end. Um, they couldn't get anything to to work there. Um, very rare to draw up something like what Leitner did all those years ago in that in that scenario. But um, there's other plays they could have dr- drawn up. Sure, but they, they didn't was, draw them up. It, it was far fetched, I think. Regardless, sure. um, it was well. What they could have drawn up what what Hoiberg <coughs> drove drove drew up for Kese at the Big Ten tournament, which was to get a shot at half court, and that he almost made. Instead, and we can get to this in a second, they basically, Baylor Sherman is a quarterback in high school, and a very good one. Yeah. And he played quarterback. And, I mean, you know, he tried to find someone open, you know, 10 feet from the hoop, and that's hard to do. That's just yeah. hard to do. It was probably their best best shot with the way I they agree. have. If you're not going to try to design the half quarter, then then they did what they had to do. Anyway, what did, so you, you, you it's the foul. Where did you, did your hand go to your mouth? Like, like what was your immediate? Oh, my reaction? jaw was on the floor. Yeah, I mean, I, I was struggling to even like I, I couldn't really look around because I'm th- I'm wondering like, yo, is this real? Like mm-hmm. I, I'm, I couldn't believe what was unfolding. Out of all the games I watched, Grant, I've I had a young career. I haven't been watching basketball for as long as you know the Bob Ryan's of the world. But um, that that might be one of the more shocking endings I've. I've ever seen based yeah. on the circumstances, based on the magnitude of the game, based on the way the game was called, to see that happen, uh, I was stunned. I was stunned. My draw was on the floor. I was I was surprised too. I usually you don't see that. I suppose there's an argument that you can make that if he had hacked him hard on the hand, um, you call it many many years ago. There was an NBA playoff game where Hubert Davis was and he was fouled. And people lost their minds. It was a Knicks Bulls game, and he was fouled. <laughs> I remember the game really well, and people were still really upset, you know, because you don't end a game on a foul. Well, I don't know. I mean, if you look at it in slow mo, which that's not what a human brain's doing right. when they call it. It was he, it he was gra- a foul. He grabs he it grabs was at his jersey. I, I feel like we've had, and you mentioned Hubert Davis. We've had. A handful of scenarios, it feels like, of, of something like this in the past few months. I think back to the Super Bowl that that holding call that people were uh, up in arms about was holding, but do you call it there? I mean, and I think even more so in this game, the way the game was officiated, I keep bringing this up, the way the game was officiated all game, it's like, do you really call that there? Like, it, And I think um, I don't know what ended up going through the, the, that officiating crew's head after that call or um, – right what ended up happening but i know i don't think i saw any of those officials from that game move on to to the final four move mm-hmm. on to houston which um it's probably directly connected to that um it just it felt like well they didn't call very many fouls during the game and there were some fouls to have been called yeah there and were it, and i saw that but I, they didn't call 
I saw the numbers. Jay Jay Williams on ESPN um, brought it up um, that some of the other Elite Eight games were in the high 30s in terms of fouls, and I think there were maybe 22 fouls called. 22 total fouls. In that game. So um, big disparity. I mean, if you watch that game, they let them play, man, especially San Diego State with their physical brand, and they pick up every foot of the court, man. For, for that to be the way that game ends, it, it was it was stunning in itself just based on the way the game transpired. About 12 minutes left in the game, Creighton leads 41-34, to 34, I think, 13, 14 minutes left. Um, you had a quote in your story, and I didn't see this quote anywhere else because most of it focused on – most of the stories focused on the foul, but I yeah, like that was, you – This was in the locker room, me and Art one-on-one. So this is a really good quote. And he, he said he couldn't. He's like, they just turned up the intensity. I don't even think I can explain it. Yeah. He's like, I don't know how to describe it. Well, when I read that quote, I, I went back and, I, again, I watched the last however many minutes. Is it possible that at the end of the game, the, what, what Kaluma's talking about is that San Diego State just had more in the tank because they're playing nine guys. And two times in the last five minutes, Aguicaro makes a shot over Art. Aguic played 16 minutes. Kaluma played 37. That they just have were they just a little fresher? And and at the end of the day, did did McDermott maybe get a little lost in the moment and forget that that the sport has stamina to it? And Creighton maybe just didn't quite have as much in the tank. I think they played a very very small fraction of it. I think uh, Art was super reflective after the game. Like he he mentioned and like some other guys like. You know, this Creighton team took the high road after this game, which is the standard of a Greg McDermott team. Sure. Um, and so some of them, when you ask them, you know, what changed in that second half for them to shoot, you know, 0 for 10 from 3 and, um, you know, for it to be so much of a disparity in shot making between halves, they were like, you know, like Trey Alexander was like, I don't think it was so much on their part. We just didn't hit open shots. And while that some of that might be true, um, San Diego State did – come alive. I mean, their ball pressure is is some of the best in this tournament. It's why Alabama went three for 27 from mm-hmm. three and gave Brandon Miller his worst game as a prospect. Right. Um, this was no fluke. Um, and when you ask Art what was the turning point, he brought up with 12 minutes left, you know, and some of this he caught. Um, he, was, he was the victim of some of this, you know, the – the pummeling, not even pummeling, because you look at the disparity, the the num- numeral difference won't tell you that on the old glass that, you know, that San Diego State killed Creighton. But the old boards they got mattered, man. Right. And he pointed to this possession with about 12 minutes left where um, San Diego State got two straight old boards and kicked out to Lamont Butler, and he had a three to cut Creighton's lead from seven to four. To four. And that was probably the point where Creighton – should have built on that lead and made it a double-digit lead, um, especially during such a half where mm-hmm. neither team could score. It was ugly. It was nasty. It was the type of game that San Diego State enjoys. Um, and Creighton had a chance to, you know, step on them and be like, okay, if you're not going to score, like I'll, we'll, we'll keep this nine-point, ten-point cushion. And it didn't happen. Lamont Butler had as big a, probably one of the bigger shots in that game looking back on it. Um, mm mm-hmm. And it, and it was engraved in, in Art's memory. Art Art remembered that very well. And so um, thinking back to the quote where he's like, I don't know what happened, um, or I don't know how to describe it, um, he was he was well aware of the turning points. Um, it was just I'm not sure how much. I mean, they, they emphasize San Diego State's presence on the old glass. But in real time, as it's happening, as Jaden Ladee is, you know, pulling yeah, down boards and Mensa is, yeah. you know, extending his reach. I'm not mm-hmm. sure how much there was that they could do in real time, especially yeah. like you mentioned, um, with how long they played. There was one, there was one minute given to a non-starter in that second half, and it was the one minute that Nemhart came off the floor with uh, whatever wrist injury. And there was a of. timeout somewhere in there because Nemhart was off the court yeah, for five and, minutes or something. But but yeah. yeah, he had to go right back in the game. And, and that's why I call it a small fraction of it because they had so many timeouts. There were so many stoppages in sure. this game. Like, uh, but. But Art, Art remembers a lot of that because he was on the floor for, for most of it. of it. Yeah, <laughs> I think of Ryan Kohlbrenner coming up short one or two times. One that was basically right, you know, the rim blocked him. Like he got there sure. and it just 
and I just feel like maybe they, there was a fifth gear. The point I'm making is that at the beginning of the season, you had these mailbags, and I'd like you to do another one of these postseason, not today, but and many of the questions were about the bench. Remember? Oh, of course. It would. I, it it ended up spiraling spiraling into stories about the bench. I mean, the bench was a big story right. down the stretch. So at the end of the season, and you know, McDermott says what he says, and there were times this season certainly the bench was very helpful. But you watch what people do, not as as much as you watch what they say. And when they got when it when it absolutely mattered, he didn't play anybody on the bench. Yeah, he was like, I, I'm in a situation where I don't apparently can't trust anybody to come in. And the difference between San Diego State and Creighton is, I think Creighton is a is a better team, starting five, and 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 I, I mean this kindly, a lot more skilled than San Diego State. Sure. Like I think they're just more skilled. But the coach on San Diego State's side, and we're going to have a story in our paper Saturday about a Gwook, convinced a Gwook rope to come back and play basically as the ninth man on the bench because he knew that <clears throat> part of how they were going to win games was to throw waves of great athletes and defensive players at opposing teams, and they won. I had, the, I had it in the paper on Sunday. I think they were like twelve and five in in possessions determined uh, in games determined by th- uh, two or fewer possessions, and two sure. in basketball is six points because you can make two three pointers. They were remarkable. They won a game forty five forty three this year, so they went into that game and they were ready. Like th- this is how they do it, and it and when we're watching it, I think we you know naturally we just watch the game, but I think by the Here's, I guess my point is this: If that game gets in overtime, I don't think Creighton wins. I don't. I, I, I've, I just, I think they would have run out of gas. I've said that same thing, and not just because of you know that aspect of it. But Trey Alexander had four fouls after that last foul uh, mm-hmm. in the game. That's uh, for all the possessions that were broken, for for all the dry spells, um, for for so much of that half that San Diego State turned into its kind of game that it loves, that yeah. nasty, nasty, hey, we're going to win shooting 33%. Mm-hmm. Some of the most disgusting stuff I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> Trey Ale- Tra- they're one of the worst teams to make them. Trey Alexander, <laughs> through all of that, is one of the few guys who could get the paint touch, get to his kill right. spot, get to the, uh, you know, initiate and get to the bucket you need to break that type of run, to right. break that def- type of defensive stance. And with four fouls, um, especially with, you know, if they call that at the end of the game, assuming they, some of that carries over to overtime, I'm not sure how long he would have lasted if he would have lasted all the overtime. And without him, then then McDermott has to turn to that bench that he didn't really count on in the second half. And um, I think it goes downhill from there. I agree. You know, that's why I wish the game had gone <clears> to <throat> overtime because I think it would have it would have borne itself out. Um, you know, Creighton didn't lose. I mean, they – they lost on the foul, obviously, but they weren't ahead going into the final possession. It was a tie basketball game, and if that foul doesn't occur, then the game goes to OT, and I thought it was advantage San Diego State. Okay, so they go to the Elite Eight. They made history. And, and also, ahead. hold yeah. on. At, at this point, the San Diego State is one of the worst teams in the Final Four. I got to disagree. They, yeah. no, no matter their, <laughs> they brand of, their, their brand of basketball is disgusting, right? Like, it makes me want to throw up, but... Uh, I don't know if it's... The, I mean, I'm I, I to be clear, like, I... Deeply appreciate what they're doing. Sure. I think that coach is really smart. Sure, he's using nine guys when most teams use seven. He's he. I'm just saying they're not one of the better teams that's ever been there. I Neither is Florida Atlantic. I can appreciate the strategy, but the offense is gross, man. You shouldn't you shouldn't be able to win games. And this is why I respect it. You shouldn't be able to win games shooting thirty whatever percent. Um, but you is UConn a five seed too? Are they? I think they One might of them's be a four. A four. I think they're, a four. they're a four, and Miami's a, a five. Yeah. The gap between Miami and San Diego State, in terms of one of them was the ACC champion and did what they. I mean, Miami. You could say the same thing about the gap on defense, though. San Diego State is is a top two. Well, there's only four teams left, but they're a top two defensive team. They were probably a. I mean, they were a top five defensive team in in the whole tournament. Probably. Oh, no question. Yeah. Their, their defense is spectacular, and they do a great job. I'm not saying they're – I'm just saying that among the final four teams in the last 10, 12 years, this was an opportunity for Creighton. Just like – and the other team that I think of is Kansas State. Kansas State's been the Elite Eight, you know, uh, three times in the last 18 years. They lost to Butler. They lost to um, 
Loyola, and they lost to Florida Atlantic. It's hard to get those back. Like, those are the games that you want to be able to play. Does this San Diego State team beat the North Carolina team last year? No, I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't, no. I don't know, man. I think that and team again, was a maybe, fluke. And again, maybe I'm biased against mid-major teams because North Carolina is an eight seed. Okay, whatever. But the reality is they're North Carolina, and they have a lot of great players. It's the same thing with that thing a couple years ago when Kentucky was the eight and they play Wichita State in the second round, and Kentucky's like a four-point favorite against a team that's 31-0. and It's because they're Kentucky, and they have Julius Randle, and they go to the final game. You know, like, the seeding stuff is what it is. But, like, for example, if Michigan had made the NCAA tournament, and they didn't belong in the NCAA tournament, they didn't earn it. But you and I both know if they go to the NCAA tournament, they could have won two games easy. They have, like, they have like two, two or three NBA players on their team. Yeah. And, and some of the teams they were playing did not. So, like, that's my point is that, you know, I don't think San Diego State has, you know, a lot of NBA stars. Now, I want to move on to the – I want to move forward to, the, to what's next. Hey, hold on. If, if you, if you want to debate this with me, at me on Twitter. I, okay. I, I do – I'm not sure I like that North Carolina team last year, but I do think – San Diego State was at least an elite eight team. Creighton should have made the Final Four. I, I, sure. I think that much. But well, they beat Alabama, but we talked last week about how I didn't think Alabama was going to be ready, and they weren't. Well, they made them look horrible. Yeah, ahead. they did. All right, so let's move on to what's next for Creighton. Um, so here's what's next. The next week, over the next week or two, what's going to happen? What, do you, what, what are the decisions that need to be made? You don't have to predict what's going to happen. But let's, let's run down the list. What decisions do you think are being mulled over by the, the, the team's top five players? Yeah, I think at least three to four of them are submitting their names to be evaluated. Now, there's a difference between submitting your name to be evaluated mm-hmm. and um, putting your name in the draft pool. That's right. Uh, I there think is. that putting your name in the draft pool only happens once you've gotten some understanding of where you could fall, teams that like you, um, you know, what might end up happening over the course of the summer. Right. Um, and what, if you know you can land somewhere on right. your feet. Um, you can pull your name out of the M- NBA draft. Just you can. Clear. Yeah. But team you, players do. But you can also make your decision before putting it there. Um, right. And so I think, uh, I don't know, I've, I've, I've seen Baylor on a— Which four will be evaluated? Everybody but Nemhard, I think. And one Nemhard. And maybe Nemhard puts his name in for evaluation. I don't know. Okay. I don't think he's in a position to really— Think about putting his name in the pool. I mean, everybody. Uh, I say that, and so many random players have put their name in the draft pool just because they're a senior or whatever. Right. And obviously, he's not, but he's talented. Baylor um, Shireman is a, will be a fifth-year senior. Ryan Colprenner will be a fourth-year junior, or fourth-year senior. Arthur Kaluma would be a third-year junior. Trey Alexander would be a third-year junior, and so would Ryan M. Harden. So... Shireman was the one that I think everybody con- – well, this guy's going to be a one-year guy. But you you think after this season is now over, there's a chance that he isn't a one-year guy. Yeah, and I think – he could return. I think the staff feels good about that. I think um, whatever it was throughout the course of the season, I think uh, when we talked to them before senior night, probably around that time was when he started to really consider a return. Um, I think – I'm not sure if it was because – he felt like he didn't get into the range or he isn't being projected into the range he'd like or right. um, whether the, the the stretch he had, uh, you know, down the stretch wasn't up to par to his own personal standard. I don't know, but um, I think he's considering running it back because there is a chance he could have a, an even better season. And I think the arguments against him don't hold as much weight in terms of returning a year and, and – and maybe that hurting his his draft. I I was under that impression earlier in, in the year. I thought that was why he would go because he is older, um, and you know age. I mean that clock ticks, man. Once mm-hmm. once you talk about the pro stuff and and older prospects are always under different microscope. They're they're hated on regardless. Um, and so with him, I was like, yeah, he he'd have to go because he's already played so much. Um, but I think considering his role. Um, regardless of where he goes, he's a contribute now guy. You, you, his shooting translates right away. Um, his secondary playmaking translates right away. Um, maybe even some of the rebounding translates right away. This is stuff teams want now as a rotational guy. Um, they're not banking on his potential. Um, and so I think right now and even a, a year from now, that doesn't change. Mm-hmm. People are still going to draft him based on, hey, come in right now, give us something now. So I think they're – 
he's probably reflected on that and seen that, hey, I can come back another year and and not hurt my chances, only maybe better them uh, because I think— And make NIL money. This is true, yeah. So um, so I think they feel good about him returning. Kalkbrenner. Uh, Kalkbrenner. Um, Kalkbrenner's— he, it, it would it would make no sense for him not to put his name uh to to at least put his name out there for evaluation right I'm pretty right. Sh- pretty sure sh- I, I, if I had to bet I think it's already happened um no I think this is a guy that he'll probably put his name in the, in the pool if we're being honest um uh it just makes sense um he's had a good year he's probably up for probably has a good chance and maybe it's Jalen Clark but he has a good chance at Naismith defensive player of the year after being named back-to-back uh Big East defensive player of the year um this is a guy that um you know he's on he's on mock drafts maybe not all of them and maybe not in the best range Mm -hmm. but there are teams I've seen that um you know are projected to bet on him within the last 10 to 5 picks maybe not the most comfortable range for him which is probably why uh, he stands to come back, um, but um, if he wanted to, I mean, he could. The thing with him is, he has such a niche role right now. Like I think of, um, he's like the opposite of Brook Lopez when Brook Lopez came out. Granted, Brook Lopez was a much higher mm-hmm. ranked prospect. Yeah, um, he was Brooke, a lottery pick. Yeah, Brook Lopez was a post scorer way back when and uh not a good defender he's right. completely flipped the script now he's a three-point shooter he's a uh one of the best defenders in the league um and Kalkbrenner he has room to work on his three-point shot I think uh that's something that you know scouts and and executives are gonna maybe toy with over the summer and see hey it's not there yet and probably give him that kind of feedback which would probably push him back to Creighton um I think there's no shot he goes to another school if, if no. that's what people are considering. No, of course not. Um, I think he likes Creighton a lot, man. I yeah. think he really likes Creighton. Um, so I think even yeah, I don't if think he, that's a guy that's going to be making that change. Sure. So I so I think even if he goes through the process, um, he'll end up back here. Kaluma. Kaluma is Kaluma could go, put him same. But you also feel like portal, potential, potentially. I think there's an outside chance he yeah. he has the portal. I don't know that. I have no intel on that, but um, I just the why I feel that Coloma makes the jump for sure. Um, I think his name his name is probably already uh, been sent to evaluators. Um, he's been in probably as many mock drafts as anybody. Um, this is dating back to before the season. Now I know his stock right. has drastically changed, uh, but he was once upon a time, you know, top ten, top fourteen projected pick. Like this was a dude that people really were, right. were high on. And the thing with Creighton's team is that everybody has a different opinion on each one of these guys. Some people like Baylor. Some people like Art. Some people like Kalkbrenner. Some people want to wait it out and see what, what what's up with Trey and his future. Um, and so. People are still, like, the people who like athletes and defensive potential and whatnot, people are still high on art. Sure. Um, they're willing to bet on, a, I think, a top 10 pick um, and take him. Uh, and I think while that might be, you know, a deterrent for others, I think he's welcoming that um, at this point. I'm, I'm not sure how much left he has to give to the college game. Um, and if he does return to the college game, like, Creighton feels like the only fit that's there. Um in terms of, you know, because, you know, he can – I mean, his style, um, he likes to ISO sometimes. He likes to be that creator sometimes at his at his size. And so um, I'm not sure how many more schools will let him rock out the way Creighton did. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think he's bound for the pros, or at least to try his hand, um, no matter where they, they find him landing. Trey Alexander. This is the one I, I I tell people I haven't really figured out yet. Um, granted, I I'm not sure I figured out any of these guys. I just I'm making. I think the first two are are pretty clear. Sure. Um, Trey Alexander. If Trey Alexander wanted, he has all the options in the world, man. This dude had a great season. He carried yeah. the scoring load for a team that reached the elite eight for a lot of the season, man. Um, mm-hmm. This dude made a huge leap this year. Um, was probably the most accurate shooter on the team based on volume. Um, yeah, based on number. Yeah. yeah. No question. Um, and so, um, well, I don't know 
that it's likely or that it's in his best interest. This is a dude that if he wanted to hit the portal would be offered. I mean, Brink's he would trucks be the number on one player. In, yeah, he would be. Yeah, he'd be the number one player in the rankings. The number one guy right now in the portal. You think so? Yeah, there are some big names in there right now. Caleb Love among them. He's better them. than Caleb Love. I think he's better than Caleb Love too. But maybe if he wasn't better than like Caleb that. Love, Caleb Love would already be in the NBA. <laughs> this is probably true. Yeah. Okay. So the number one guy is a guy from Oregon who's you know average like six and four. Six. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, Trey's better than that. <laughs> but but I actually think Trey Alexander could play in the NBA in terms next of year. a combination of college fit right now and and NBA potential. He's he's probably up there top five in oh, the no quarter. Question. Yeah. Um, I don't think he'd do that. I think I think don't you think the NBA is a real chance for him? Like I think he he's welcoming that idea. I'm sure I'm sure he's put his name up for evaluation. Um I think that's probably the longest talk of any of these players that they're gonna have to have with their family and 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 um just decide what to do because he has a very there is a chance that if he comes back and he does what he did this year, maybe takes it up another notch, that um he could be a first round lock, I think, yep. next year, especially on a draft that that won't be as deep next year, probably. Right. Um, because there are, you you correct me if I'm wrong. There are at least three. I'm sorry, there are at least four and maybe five non college players who are going to go in the lottery. Oh, I mean, the, uh, two, the twins, Scoot Henderson, potentially the, four of the top five, or and then the guy from France, college. yeah, Wemby. And then there's a fifth one. I can't remember who it is. So oh, there's five guys that aren't in college that Scoot. are going. Did you say Scoot? Scoot, Scoot the yeah. two twi- the twins. Yep. Yeah. And then Brandon Miller's probably in the mix for, well, and for he, top he was three. a college guy, but you know what I'm saying? Like there's, I think there's another one that's in the G League that's going to be a lottery pick. And that, uh, that, that, that wears down the college guys that would go in. Yeah. I mean, there are people scattered all player. across this overseas. And so he, if he wanted to, he could have a chance. And not to say it's because next year stands to be a lesser draft, but – he, he's, uh, with another year of development, he stands to be a first round. Does stand lock. to be a lesser draft. Um, <laughs> still, I think just with another year of development yeah. period, I think he would go higher in this draft if they did it again next year. Um, so, um, but with all that being said, um, I think he's putting his name out there for evaluation. Uh, I can't say whether he'll test the waters or not. I think it's probably it's probably something he would want to do, um, but it de- it depends on. What he hears from evaluators, sure. I think. Um, I think if he doesn't like what he's hearing, because I think I've seen him on mock drafts less than any of these guys. I mean, the people that are high on him are super high on him. But I don't know that there are that many people right now because I think so many people are sold on him being part of the next cycle instead. Right. Um, so um, I think if he's under that impression that, hey, next year is your year, he probably might not even bother with, with, uh, with the draft process. But that's up to him. Um, the draft process, I think, will help him in terms of figuring out where he's at. But he has to get the feedback from evaluators first, I think. And then, um, so so he has options out the world. But I I, I do think there is a chance, uh, a mm-hmm. probably a pretty good chance, assuming that he doesn't like what he sees from the. I mean, it would take a lot of convincing, I think, from the whole draft process for him to really make that leap. Right. Uh, so I think the staff probably feels good about his chances of of coming back. Portal time. So Creighton needs more players, and that's obvious. If you go into the final game of the year and you're playing guys 37 minutes each, and one of those guys can't really – he couldn't score. He took one shot, you know, that being Nimhard. If, you, if, that, if that guy can't even spend five minutes on the bench resting his hand, you obviously know more players. Farabello is gone. Yeah. Christophilus is gone. And the way, the way the team was built, Nemhard was always going to have to – he was one of two players that was – Unbelievably indisposable, um, right? And, and him and Cogburner because nobody else could do what they do. And I'm not sure reaching into the portal could you could find an, uh, two guys that could, you know, uh, spot what they do in however many minutes. Understood. Yeah. But they've got to find. They've got to. So it, we'll we'll start this name and then we'll get to Nebraska very quickly. Um, we'll start with Isaac Trout. So yeah. Isaac Trout is in the is in the transfer portal. He's leaving Virginia, and he said he's coming close to home. My belief is that it's down to probably two, that being Nebraska and Creighton. And no, if there was a, know? If there was a third school, <laughs> it would be like K-State. Sure. But I don't, think there, I don't think it is. I think this I is think Nebraska so or Creighton. And I, my sense is Creighton. Now, there's reasons for that related to just, you know, friends he has at Creighton. And also, I think the visit to Creighton went really well. He told me that. 
when when it was at the time. I believe one of the reasons that he left home was related to what other people wanted for him than what he necessarily wanted. Would this be a player that they that they could do a lot for them? A hundred percent. The fit is absolutely there. Um, and you know, at this time, uh, you know, I. I think so much of it depends on, and you saw this with with John uh, Tanji from Colorado State. He instantly committed to Dennis Gates, even though there had been contact there um, with Creighton. Um, because I think he's probably been talking to Missouri for a few weeks. You know? But the thing is, no, <laughs> nobody wants to wait around no. for these guys to make decisions, right? Well, the, so, the, the guys don't want to wait around because the spots the spots fill up. Yeah, and so. Um, Tanji did the right thing. Like yeah, he, so he got it done. <laughs> I, I can almost guarantee that was part of Tanji's thought process. It was smart and, because look at all the guys that have <laughs> entered since he committed. Yeah, and so <laughs> it's, and so uh, you know, it, it, it's a tricky thing for Creighton to have to deal with. Their hands are almost tied based on some of these guys' decisions, and because of Kaluma, I think that's the position their hands are probably tied most. Unless sure. he just comes out and say, "Hey, I'm." I'm putting my my name in the pool and I'm not coming out. Um, so with that being his position, what, what Trout plays, um, it makes it tough for them to really uh, engage in super serious talks right now. Um, but I could see him being a Creighton guy. I could see the fit there. Obviously, Creighton was in his final list or whatever. Um, it makes all the sense in the world. I mean, two four seven has him a uh, crystal ball, whatever. A lot of people put put weight in that. Um, and the name's been tied to Creighton for for yeah, weeks Mike now. Mike Cristobal's got him to Creighton too. <laughs> sure, like, yeah. I mean, I, I I would I would probably do the same. Nebraska thing. could probably use him more, but I just don't. I mean, yeah, but it, but it's just, it's just hard for them to move while Kaluma is kind of in the balance. Like it's it's harder to make that happen. As much as you know, Christophilus opens things up with that uh, roster spot. You you just you cannot go hard on Trout. While Kaluma still, because I mean Kaluma is such a big part of his team. If sure. there is a chance that he can come back, um, I seriously doubt that McDermott is turning that down. I get um, that, re- regardless. Well, I of mean, the but it's okay to have another player at the four. But this is a guy. I mean, you know? Trout is the level of talent that you would want starting right at the four. This That's is a right. starter. I mean, he could probably go anywhere and start. I mean, he would have been a huge part of Virginia. I just think that. Fit wasn't there. He want like like he says like well, people are saying he wants to come home. Um, just different factors. This is a guy that starts on most teams in college basketball. Um, just on his fit and talent level. So um, it, it it's a tricky situation now. Um, they are. I mean, they are recruiting to fill that spot though. I mean, I I saw them attached to to uh, T J. I, I forget his last name. The 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 guard for for Washington State. The average fifteen this past year. Like, yeah. Like they probably they've probably reached out to the Texas Tech guy too. Who's that? Oh, uh, Farik. Yeah. Oh, the big man. Yeah, yeah. But I, see, and and this is the thing. Well, he's not. He's more of like a Kaluma position. Like I think they, I think they're set at center. If Colt Brenner comes back, then they've got their centers. Fred King was a pretty good backup. I mean, all things considered, as a true freshman, he was pretty good. Yeah, but I mean. And, and, and somebody, this is something I think you might want to monitor too. Some of the bench guys, how they like Christophilus probably saw everything before it happened. Like he was like, "Hey, I'm not going to sit around and wait for these dudes." Right. Well, kind of like time. Yeah, there's yeah. going to be a few more players um, because who do that, I think. because you know, assuming the chance that the Trey Alexander comes back, that's like three or four guys still ahead of Christophilus. Man, I mean, him. We were talking about Alexander Farabello. Schultzberg. Um, and so, and then, so like, you got to pay attention to the starter decisions and the domino effect it has on the bench um, because there are still probably potentially guys that could leave because they don't want to well, sure. sit and get played. Attrition is common and normal. It happens every year in basketball. Nebraska's yeah. lost a couple. They may lose another depending on what they what they add. We're going to flip, flip quickly to Nebraska, and then we'll get out. Uh, so Nebraska is in the market. They're gonna. It's gonna come down to three teams. It'll come down to Nebraska, Xavier, and West Virginia, for Kerr Kresa. I think that's how you say his last yeah. name. Um, a really dynamic player, who uh, you know led Arizona this season. Arizona was stacked with talent. Um, obviously, they lost to Princeton in the first round. Yeah. 
Nebraska likes his chances. The challenge with this with this is that his former coach is at Xavier. So you may be watching this guy in the Big East. Uh, and then West Virginia is West Virginia. And some players, with the thing that you get with Bob Huggins is Huggins will let you kind of be whoever you want. And all I'll say about it is that Nebraska, if they land this guy, they're landing one of the best players in the portal. But simultaneously, they are landing a player who's volatile and will change will change the trajectory either upward or downward of what they do. And it would be a lot to stake, you know, an important fifth season. It'd be a lot to stake that on that guy. Now, he is better, in my opinion, than any other point guard they've had. But it's a lot to stake because does he fit the culture? And it's, it's a lot to ask of a, a point guard of his mode. I mean, um, you look at his lowest moments – the shot making isn't crazy. I mean, he's a good player, but uh, the shot making isn't. He misses a lot of shots. Yeah, the shot making isn't out of this world. I spent a lot of time watching him yesterday. What he would be really good in this team is A, rebounding. He rebound about six a game. And B, he could have seven to eight assists a game. Sure. And then maybe you get to score nine or ten. He would be he would be caught like a triple double threat, but he wouldn't be 14, 15 points a game. Yeah, and so they, they would have to, as, as big of a name as he is, they have to build around him accordingly. It, it has to be a big summer for Hoiberg, even with land increase, if that's a possibility. If they keep Kese and they keep C.J. Wilcher and they add one more shooter, I think they've got the backcourt around him that can make him look pretty good um, because Kese can shoot. Uh, the, the, the bigger concern is in the post. Yeah. They have to replace Derek Walker, and I'm just saying, they don't know exactly what they have with Blaze Keita until they have yet another summer with him because last summer he went back home and he – there's not a lot you can do when you go back home to where right. he went home to. And so he's going to – they have a whole summer with him, and then they have a whole summer with Breidenbach, and in my opinion they have to get two more players because you don't really know what you have with those two players, and we'll just see what they do. We'll, we'll have more on on him maybe next week. I I think Kreese will make a decision by either – well, he'll make it by the end of this week, I think. And if he's Nebraska, and there's a chance – now that Nebraska is kind of working with the 1890 initiative or whatever it's called, there's a chance he could play in Nebraska. And it would be really something because you want to talk about the guy that would buy most deeply into the Creighton-Nebraska rivalry right away. It would be him. He's an, he's an odd duck. He wore his first name on the back of the jersey yeah. because Steve Kerr used to wear the jersey, and Kerr and Kerr were the same. Different guy. That is our podcast for this week. For Joel, I'm Sam. Thanks for listening to the Half Court Press podcast. We'll be back next week to talk about whatever developments happen uh, with the team in the next week. I think there's going to be a lot. That's my hunch. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.